why is sitting so dangerous? From your research and understanding and all your work, what are some things you can pinpoint to really drive this home so people can look about sitting differently? Like, what are some of the things that make prolonged sitting so dangerous for health? So the question kind of comes in of how long is prolonged sitting? One minute, is that too long? That's it, I gotta get up and do jumping jacks? No, there is some research behind that. At 30 minutes, we have reduced blood to our brain, but the other part is fat loss. The enzymes that basically help our metabolism are shut down by as much as 90% for some people after 30 minutes of sitting. Yeah. And so then all of a sudden you're having this accumulated effect of, all right, so the fat is not being stored in the muscles as properly and moved where it needs to be to be burned properly. That is, of course, going to keep it more in the arteries and affect your cardiovascular risk. The fact that there's less blood flowing to your brain, you're not going to be able to function as well overall, and you're going to feel more groggy. Who knows the bad decisions you might make? Hey there, my friend, and welcome back to another episode here on the Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project podcast. This is Dr. Anthony Walduzzi. I'm the founder and CEO here at the FFP and FMP, the host of this podcast, and I'm super excited to welcome you to this conversation that I just had with Dr. Stefan Zavalin. Dr. Stefan is a doctor of physical therapy, but above all, he is a movement enthusiast who is on a mission to champion the message that people need to sit less and move more. And I wanted to bring Dr. Stefan on specifically because a few years back, I was really getting into the research that was showing that sitting is the new smoking. There was all these headlines in all these magazines saying that sitting is super dangerous. So I started to dig in and I'm like, wow, this isn't actually a problem. And I want to cite a couple of these studies before we bring Dr. Stefan on and, and talk about this stuff. There was a 2010 study with 185,000 participants that showed that people who sat more than six hours a day prolonged sitting had a 71% increase in mortality rate, the rate at which they died. And even more alarmingly, there was another study that showed that even when people exercised four to seven hours per week, so let's say almost like an hour of exercise per day, but they still sat for around six hours a day, the mortality rate increased by 50%. So here's the deal and here's the message. Sitting is uniquely dangerous for our bodies. And I want to really clarify what Dr. Stefan taught me. It's prolonged sitting that's the problem. Look, we can sit for a little bit here and there, but if we have a job that's keeping us sitting all the time or we're driving in a car for many hours, it is damaging our health. In fact, sedentary behavior increases the risk of some types of cancer by up to 68%. Sitting for long periods of time increases the risk of diabetes by up to 112%. All of this is supported by the research. In this conversation, we bring Dr. Stefan on and he breaks some of the stuff down, why it's happening in the body, but more importantly, how we can fix it, what we can do with our daily lives to readjust our desks, do some more standing, the right interval for how much we should move versus sitting ratios, some great stretches we can do. Dr. Stefan's a wealth of knowledge, and I think this is an important conversation for you and your family because if you're sitting for long periods of time, it is impacting your health, your cardiovascular health, your spinal health, your blood sugar, and even leading to muscle loss like Dr. Stefan shared. My mind was just blown by that. So very powerful stuff. I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. And Dr. Stefan also mentions some different links and stuff inside the show, like the link to his Instagram and his websites, where you can find more information about his work and get more useful tips. All that's linked inside the show notes. And I also want to link some videos from our YouTube channel as well, because last year we shot a video on some good stretches and spinal stretches for people who sit for long periods of time. Those are also helpful. Those will be linked in the show notes. So without further ado, let's bring Dr. Stefan on. I hope you enjoy this amazing conversation. You take some really actionable stuff away from this. And if you do like this, share it with somebody. More people need to know about the dangers of sitting because this is where our culture is pushing us. It's where we're pushing our kids. So we got to really understand this stuff so we can make the adjustments to live long and healthy lives. Let's get into today's conversation. Dr. Stefan, welcome officially to the Fit Father podcast. Uh, It's such a pleasure to be here. I've been listening and on the edge of my seat. So I'm really excited for this conversation because very rarely do we have an expert in movement who really champions this idea that sitting is directly dangerous for our health and our longevity. And I really see you as a man that's trying to lead effectively a cultural revolution in work and at home to help people understand, one, the dangers of sitting, two, the amazing gift of movement, and three, perhaps to break the kind of cycle of thinking where many people believe that exercise and more of this stuff is the solution, where you're over here sharing a message that maybe it's less 
of stuff like sitting. So before we get into that, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your background, how you got so passionate about movement, and we'll start there. And then I want to get directly into why sitting is so dangerous for us. Sure. Uh, Honestly, my background ran the gambit. Um, uh, strangely enough, I sort of, I started out, um, I gave up on, on exercise and everything. When I was in fifth grade, I said, I don't want to do gym. Gym is boring. I joined orchestra instead. Cause if you were an orchestra, you didn't have to go to gym. <laughs> and so I got overweight as a result because things just kept on dropping off. And finally in high school, I went, I got to do something about this. It didn't know anything. And so I tried and tried and tried, failed. The dieting was looking back at it, stupid, frankly speaking. Um, the exercise regimen was preposterous. And then I got into undergrad and said, okay, I want to learn more about this. So I got my degree in kinesiology, my bachelor's. And then I said, all right, I want to learn even more about this. When I found out physical therapy was a thing, I said, you get paid for this. This is amazing. I definitely want to do this. And so I got my doctorate in physical therapy. And that's really been the kind of the guiding force of all of it, of understanding, okay, exercise, the benefits, But along that path, I understood uh, exercise is great, and I love exercise. Um, But exercise, we are only able to input for a certain amount of time. We need to do something else. And there's some other way that I can impact people because I would just keep on telling patients, hey, you need to do these exercises, correct this posturally. And finally, I got to the point where I said, I need to have more of an impact. I need to be able to touch more people. And that's where I said, okay, maybe it's more about the culture. Um, and trying to introduce that. And I love that you kind of said that cultural part because I've jokingly been calling it the movement movement, Mm -hmm. um, which people have told me to trademark. I haven't yet. Please nobody steal it. But uh, (laughs) that's kind of been the driving force of me understanding it's, it's a much bigger thing than just fixing it later on and having sort of this reactive healthcare with physical therapy. I need to do some more preventative care and reach out to more people. I love that. And I definitely feel like we're kindred spirits in that sense of wanting to basically shout this message um, from the rooftops. And um, that's why I'm so glad to have you here, because I know there's a lot of guys listening to this that are interested in health. But I think a lot of guys listening might be a little confused. Like, is sitting not one of the most natural things our bodies do? Why is it so bad for our bodies? What's the problem with sitting? Right. And that's that's the one that, that always gets me that people go, well, isn't it natural to sit? And yes, It's natural in the sense that your body is able to be in that posture and assume that posture. True. And really, we have so many different complex postures that our bodies can do. The question goes to how long are you in that posture? Mm -hmm. Because um, standing on one leg is perfectly fine. But if I made you stand on one leg for eight hours, you would not be very happy with me. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's sort of that same thing with sitting as we assume the same posture we not only sit in it for hours, we do it day in, day out, month in, year in, and it just accumulates. And it's this static posture that's always repeated, repeated. That's really what's not natural. It's not the posture of and of itself. And this usually falls into this question of, okay, well, what's, the, what's good posture and what's bad posture? I argue there really isn't a good or bad posture. It's more how long are you spending in that posture? Mm-hmm. Um, because... Sure, getting into a handstand, plenty of people can do that, but you don't want to spend way too long there. We're not designed for that as opposed to a standing and walking kind of a posture. And so that's why a lot of what I talk about is, can we do the frequency of movement as opposed to sitting or standing in one only posture for a long period of time? Totally makes sense. So the danger is, well, the body is amazing because it can establish many different postures, but the prolonged nature of any posture for too long can be pathological and can cause changes. Now let's get into like the specifics of sitting, right? You kind of seem simple. You squat down, you put your down, your spine is somewhat stacked and maybe you're looking at a computer. So like what's actually happening to our bodies, particularly like maybe the spine and in certain spinal supportive muscles, when we sit in a prolonged position for let's say three, four hours, which is very common for many people who are working. Right. Um, so just the, the position alone, we can talk about just being in that position. Your knees are kind of halfway up to your chest, which mm-hmm. is called hip flexion, which is your hip flexors are going to be tightening and you're repeatedly in that shortened position of the muscle, meaning they're going to continuously be tight. Um, and the reason I talk about hips also is for guys, we have a diagnosis that's sometimes known as dude hips, mm-hmm. which means that they're incredibly tight. Um, this doesn't help by any means of repeatedly just that stiffness of motion. We have usually a rounded back. So as much as we think, oh, I'm going to sit upright and I'm going to do great, within just a few minutes, most of us ground our shoulders, move forward. Mm -hmm. And so that's putting additional stress 
onto that lower back as, as you're bending further and further forward. And most guys, we don't have great mobility in our thoracic spine. Our lumbar spine doesn't have a lot of motion to begin with. And so you're just, you're putting a lot of stress there that doesn't need to be there. And it's not getting the motion that it needs because your spine needs a lot of good motion. Um, if we talk about discs, they're like little sponges. They need to be compressed so they can push out the waste, but also they need to be expanded so they can take in the nutrients. If we're just sitting there and constantly putting weight through them and not allowing them the movement they desire, you're going to have more and more issues with your spine um, in that kind of a shape or form. Same thing happens with the muscles along the back of your spine. Those guys are your extensors. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that really kind of pull you back and help you sit upright. But we usually just, if we're sitting forward, pulling at them way too much. And so they're getting weaker and weaker and weaker because they can't, they're being asked to overwork and they're just tightening up and you're not giving them the rest and support that they really truly need because they're just constantly being forced down. Okay. So we have these powerful hip flexors mm -hmm. that are attaching to the low back, pulling on that. We have this rounded upper back, which is also causing effectively problems and keeping the front of our bodies very tight. So we're kind of getting the spine out of its natural alignment. And then the extensor muscles on the back, we can feel those around our spine are getting weak. And so this seems like a problem. And then you mentioned the discs as well, which we have the stacked vertebrae and the discs in between are getting compressed. And we want them to have, obviously they have some compression, but we want like more of an expansive that increases blood flow and nutrients. So this is all happening. And then I'm also thinking as you're talking, like aging is kind of a process of like compression and dehydration in a sense, like those discs. So, I mean, I think this probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but this seems like it's probably even more important for people in their forties, fifties, and sixties to pay attention to this when there's like a dehydrating and, and, a, and a less disc height. So let's talk about that a little bit. Like how does aging affect the spine and how does like effectively sitting make it even worse? Absolutely. So with aging, you've got two big things that are um, affecting the spine and generally keeping up our posture and our musculoskeletal system. Um, you've got one that's stenosis, which is just the narrowing of the canal. Effectively, what that does is it forces us in order to open up a little bit more of our spine, we need to bend slightly forward. And so that's where we see the older that people get, they tend to bend further and further and further forward. Mm -hmm. Part of that is due to that bony change. So you're already bending forward, now you're being forced further and for, forward by gravity. The muscles on your back are weak. Now we talk about weak muscles as we age, especially as we get way further into past fifties uh, and so sarcopenia or the wasting of muscle due to age really kicks up. Um, and so now you're not only fighting the fact that the muscles are weak, now they're not going to be growing and working quite as well as they were all those years back. Mm -hmm. And so it's consistently fighting that where really we need to be strengthening those muscles and getting the right movement in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, what's interesting is I'm reflecting on the kind of stuff that our fit father program members do. Like we're big without like being super explicit about it. We're big proponents of doing stuff that involves like some spinal extension, like things like kettlebell swings, things like rows with scapular retraction, things like bracing the core for some kind of overhead press. Like these are foundational things as we age. So that seems like a good thing. Like exercises are a good thing, but I heard you say something on another podcast and I was really interested to bring you on for this reason is it seemed to me that one of your main points was it doesn't matter how much you exercise if you're still sitting for like eight, nine hours a day. Maybe there is some offset, but it's like, even if you're doing good exercises and you're doing the stuff offsetting muscle loss with age, there's still a danger of prolonged sitting. So let's talk about that. Cause I know there's a lot of people who think they're doing good by exercising, but may still have this sitting problem. Right. And the exercising is great. Um, that's one of my sometimes worries is people think I'm anti-exercise. Exercising is great. The problem was there was some Australian research done. And this is, this is kind of the stat that really made me go, I need to do something about this. This is what, what kind of jettisoned me out of all of it. And it's that if you sit 11 or more hours a day, it was shown that there's an increase of, the, of premature death, the risk of premature death by 40%. <laughs> that hits... But that's not the bad news. The bad news of that article was that an hour of exercise, when they accounted for that, didn't decrease the risk. So it's not about increasing and exercising more. It is truly in that sense of sitting less. And that's not to say stop exercising. You should No, you should definitely exercise. And there are so many amazing benefits to exercise. But it's kind of where you can't outwork a bad diet. Mm -hmm. You can't out-exercise bad sitting habits and really inactivity habits, we should say. 
Um, mm -hmm. Before people start saying, I'll just lay down and that's not technically sitting. It's the same thing. It's an activity. Uh, let's be real there. But it's, it's sort of that same concept of we're doing almost too much of the bad that, yeah, we're bringing in the good, but it may not be enough. We need to it, decrease yeah. the bad. It's like you're eating a bunch of junk food, but you take a multivitamin. It's like, yeah, I mean, that kind of concept. Now, so like the exercise is, is important because it can strengthen those, those spinal muscles. It can give you better extension. It can pre prevent some of the age-related muscle mass, the sarcopenia. But why is sitting so dangerous? Like I have an intuition that it has to do not just with like the spinal compression and, and changes to the nervous system, but the cardiovascular system too is like involved in this. Like tell me why, like it, from your research and understanding and all your work, like what are some things you can pinpoint to really drive this home so people can look about sitting differently? Like what are some of the things that make pro long sitting so dangerous for health on many different systems right and just to to point for cardiovascular for example that the, the same study found that um it was uh, eight hours or more doubles the risk of cardiovascular disease which is still number one killer even mm -hmm. during COVID times yeah um and so it's it's a, it's a major major issue in that regard granted for that specific stat exercise does a lot more but the question kind of comes in of, okay, well, what, it, how long is prolonged sitting? Mm -hmm. you know, is one minute, is that too long? I said, I got to get up and do jumping jacks. No, no, there, there is some, some research behind that. And that's really, it's that when you go past a certain time, the accumulation of this happens. So what is that time at about 20, 30 minutes? So around 20 minutes, we basically have almost this turning off or great reduction in the gene expression for basically muscles start to break down. So the idea is that I, I, people get this misconstrued as muscles break down at 20 minutes of sitting. No, no, no. The genes basically start to think about breaking down muscle at about 20 minutes. So 20 minute breaks, you're perfectly fine. You can sit for longer than 20 minutes. At 30 minutes, we have reduced blood to our brain, which is where I love putting in if you want to be more productive, get up every 30 minutes, because even though you think, I know I got to sit down and work for hours, that's a good time uh, for you to do that. But the other part is fat loss, which is so important and, and so much of your audience is concerned with, is that the enzymes that basically help our metabolism are shut down by as much as 90% for some people after 30 minutes of sitting. Yeah. And so then all of a sudden you're having this accumulated effect of, all right, so the fat is not being stored in the muscles as properly and moved where it needs to be to be burned properly. That is, of course, going to keep it more in the arteries and affect your cardiovascular risk. The fact that there's less blood flowing to your brain, you're not going to be able to function as well overall, and you're going to feel more groggy. Who knows the bad decisions you might make? Mm -hmm. um, there was a great recent Halloween candy episode. Maybe you will forego that and, and eat the crazy 500 grams of sugar or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. And so this sort of builds on itself. Um, when we go even kind of further than that, if we go to six hours of sitting, anxiety and depression is, is what's more prevalent there. So we can see that the mental health also gets affected besides just the physical. Yeah, that's powerful. So because we're sitting, I'm thinking about the blood flow of the brain. It like the part of the leg muscles role is the contraction of the leg muscles is helping get that blood to return up to the heart, like because the blood pools with gravity. So maybe the sitting is not contracting those leg muscles. Is that one of the mechanisms by which, you know, blood kind of stays down there when sitting? That is one of the mechanisms. The other also is uh, the posture that we get of the forward head where the mm -hmm. chin juts out forward. Yeah. And so that kind of, that restricts also just specifically cerebral blood, blood flow. Right. Um, in that That's sense. good. But absolutely, yes, the sitting down, the muscles aren't working as well. And so we're not able to bring the blood back up um, to, the, to the heart, uh, which is a big issue. Another interesting one, um, and this is for especially overweight or obese individuals is just due to the way that the pelvis is sitting on um, the muscles on your glutes, it will actually, the longer you sit, cause increased breakdown because there's more pressure and sustained pressure on them. So a lot of times we talk about back health and those uh, extensors. The kettlebell swings are a spectacular exercise to show you that, hey, you can use your hips and the glutes to support your low back muscles. And that's mm -hmm. what it, it primarily teaches because you're not trying to heave it with just your back. Right. And if you have individuals like that that are sitting for a prolonged period of time, those glutes are, are wasting more and more. And so that prolonged sitting is not helping, even if they may be incorporating some of those kettlebell swings. And so they could get better at that by sitting a little bit less. That's just, it's just fascinating. Like, 
as we discover more of this stuff, it must be that for those listening, like muscle is metabolically expensive. Like our body needs a reason to hold on to muscle. So it seems to me as I'm listening to you that when we sit, the body is getting this prolonged inactivity signal and perhaps the pressure itself, right? is changing like the different hormones that are, are involved with breaking down fat and then also wasting muscle tissue, like use it or lose it. Like that's, that's pretty amazing how that is. So what do you suggest instead for someone who's listening to this right now? And they're like, yeah, I think I'm sitting too much. My back aches. You know, I feel like I always need to do this kind of stuff. And I know I sit, you know, at least five, six hours a day. What's, what's the cultural shift we're looking to make? Cause we still need to work. So what are some things practically we can do to, to make the situation better? Right. So the, the immediate thing that I think helps people is get it getting a timer or getting something else set to where you go okay and by the way i said the 30 minutes and that's ideal 20 every 20 or 30 minutes to get up that is ideal if you're the kind of person that sits for two or three hours straight without getting up maybe every hour is where you start and then you go to 45 minutes don't feel that it has to be so precise Um, but it's finding those times to break up your sitting a little bit more now this initially says yes we need to move more truly standing and walking for a minute or two minutes added up throughout the day, that takes down your sitting by maybe, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's not a huge change, but that's where you can start because it'll get you in the habit of, oh, I need to do something. Oh, this could be done differently. The next part is changing this mindset shift of not moving more, but sitting less. And what in the world does that mean? Because people go, isn't that really the same thing? So with moving more, it's kind of like these breaks. You stand up and you do an exercise. You stand up, you go get a cup of coffee, whatever else it might be, you're not sitting. But with sitting less, we're looking, can anything in your job be turned into a standing activity? You're doing the same work, but you're just doing it in standing instead of sitting. Um, Video calls for me are the best. That's what I like to do. And most of the time, if my back is feeling great, it means I had a lot of video calls Mm -hmm. because I'm standing up for them. And I know that for that entire time, it's going to be broken up. Phone calls, I'm usually pacing during that entire time. It gives you the time to actually walk around um, and do that. So you might find those specific things. Now, we can get into their ergonomics and a lot of that of setting up your desk for standing because that can get difficult for some people depending on what they have, what they don't have. I don't have a standing desk because that's what, uh, do you need a standing desk? I put my monitor up on a pile of books and I can still do these Zoom calls perfectly well because most of the time I don't need to use the keyboard in the middle of, of it all. So there are solutions and there are kind of easier ways, but it's finding how do you adjust your work so that a portion of it you're doing standing. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how far are we taking this? How much should I do? Should I just do all of it standing? No. If you are used to standing 30 minutes or an hour throughout your workday, throughout the eight hours, we should say, if you jump to four hours, way too much. Mm -hmm. Your knees are going to hurt. Your back's going to be sore. Your muscles aren't ready for that. Start out with a 30 minutes or maybe an hour throughout the day and then slowly add as you're getting better and better at it. And this is something that your program also does very well. You don't throw people in, you let them go at their own pace Mm -hmm. as they need to go um, because that's that's really what it is. When it comes to physical movement, we're all individuals. So adjusting Mm -hmm. this is gonna be all dependent on you. That makes a lot of sense. And I think like what you were kind of getting at with addressing your immediate environment and how you can make direct changes in where you work regularly is probably like the first best step. I can reflect back to, I don't know, maybe like 10 years ago, I got my first standing desk and it was one that can go up and down. And I found at the time I would stand for a little bit, sit for a little bit, but it was really helpful to be able to move it up and down and experience the differences. And now today, having done that for so many years, I think I spend probably 90% of my day at least standing or at least when I'm working and actually feels better for me, but it didn't always feel that way. There's like this transition period that you need to go through. So that makes a lot of sense. What are some other considerations people should be thinking about when it comes to like ergonomics, whether that's like screen height, the types of chairs you think are the best um, and these kinds of things. The best thing. So if we're looking at a, a seated setup, which vast majority of people have. Um, Here are are the steps for making sure that you're set up properly. Now, remember, we did mention good, bad posture, not really necessarily a thing, but neutral posture where you're putting the least amount of stress, that is going to be where you're going to be able to uh, sit for the longest time without overstressing um, the spine. So how do you get to that? 
monitor up to eye level. And we're talking about the top portion of your monitor should just be at or maybe just slightly above your eye level. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to sit all the way back in your chair. It truly doesn't matter what chair you have. Most chairs are pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, Office chairs, they have good lumbar support. But you're going to sit all the way back, really as far back as you can. Then scoot the chair up and prop up your feet. Here's the catch. A lot of times there's a discrepancy for leg length and people tend to scoot up forward in their chair and not let the backrest do what it needs to do. Hmm. So then they can put their feet flat on the ground. By putting something under your feet, you can use a stool, you can use boxes, books. There are plenty of things that you don't have to buy something specific for it. To prop it up, you allow your body to sit all the way back and the chair to do its job. Hmm. The next portion about scooting all the way forward is the part where people are too far back and they have to lean forward to see something on their screen. So you have to make sure that the chair move your body up so that you don't have to tilt forward away from the backrest. So that way the chair is giving you all the support that it can and the monitor by being high up is promoting you to sit up straighter because you have to, otherwise you'd be looking straight down and you won't be able to quite see it. So that's the easy quick setup for that. For standing, if you decide to do it, the only really big difference is you don't, now don't have a chair. So all those wonderful glute muscles and your core and extensors, you have to use them now to maintain that neutral spine. And that can be really difficult for people initially, which is yeah. why you kind of have to ease your way into it and start with 5, 10, 15 minutes of standing and then grow that out to longer periods of time. Okay. So I want to recap a couple of these things just to make sure that I understand one, this idea that it's, you actually recommend it's better for people not to make complete transition, but to do this gradually from sitting set up to standing, because you want to lengthen certain muscles that are tight, get used to holding proper posture. Cause if you're standing, but you're in bad posture, you're probably still creating different types of problems. That's number one. Number two, what I thought was really cool and important is to use your chair's backrest right? So the chair is there, you get back onto the backrest. So back is flush, but then you need to move the chair close enough to the desk. So you're not having to hunch forward off the backrest to see the screen. And then you elevate your feet enough that you have good contact feet are firmly contacted hips are level back is on backrest. Like, is that the ideal position? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that you're letting it support you because those muscles, those extensors that are so tired, that backrest helps to, to, let them relax and not have to work all the hours that you're making them work. So yeah, that's exactly it. What about the arms? What do we do with our arms? Like some chairs have armrests, some chairs don't have armrests. Like I used to have a point where I would have elbow pain from being in a weird position on the arms and in, because in, I was working a lot of hours on a, on a seated desk. Like what do you recommend on the arm setup for a proper chair sitting? If there is advice on that. Absolutely. So, um, my chair, and this is, this is ideal, but most chairs may not have it, is that you can shift your armrests up and down. Mm -hmm. Because the idea what ends up happening is we get a lot of people with headaches um, because they scrunch up their shoulders too high and they're shrugging it up. Partially that's due to stress, but Mm -hmm. also if your armrests are just set in and they're too high, you're kind of pushed up into that position automatically. But if you let them drop, it's constantly pulling at your upper traps, which is then pulling at your neck and pulling at, uh, at the back of your head. And that's going to cause tension headaches as well. So if you have armrests, you want them up to where you have about a 90 to 100 degree bend in your elbow mm-hmm. when you're using um, your keyboard. And usually you can move your keyboard on a mouse where that's, that's pretty appropriate and easy. But that's the ideal thing. The other catch with armrests is that's usually the limiter for scooting your chair up. Thanks. A lot of people, they'll hit uh, before they get in there. Now, in a perfect world for my desk, I have it where it can scoot all the way under. Um, and I could sit with my belly button effectively touching my desk, but that's going to be the, the part where you have to work with it. If that's the case and you're going, I can't be close enough to my screen, but also sit all the way back in the chair. You can try using a lumbar roll or putting a pillow as the part of your backrest to kind of extend your backrest mm-hmm. towards you. Yeah. But really at that point, I would say, is there something you can do about a different chair? Um, mm-hmm. And I would even at that point forgo the armrests for the ability to sit a little bit closer. Okay. That makes total sense. So just to, just to repeat that, it's like, there is the option to put something behind your back, which I've done. I used to put like a foam roller behind my back, but you're, but I did also notice it's not as ideal because you want that complete full contact if possible. 
and then elevating the monitor too as well with like, I'm actually using two yoga blocks for my monitor to make sure it's like eye height, but like books also work, but like actually getting that monitor up. Cause I think what happens is low monitors, people still tend to like the eye will hunch to where the monitor is. And then you're still creating that curve in the upper spine. That seems problematic, right? The catch with, with this is now we're so many people are remote and laptops are, it seems to me something that most, most workers love using. Here's the problem with laptops. The keyboard and the monitor are attached. And the positioning, when we talked about the fact that the keyboard is way down here and the monitor needs to be raised, you can't do that on a laptop. So inevitably, I say one of two. You have to compensate exactly how you said. You will either, if the laptop's on the table, you have to hunch over to get to it. If you put the laptop up on something, you're doing T-Rex arms to type. Yeah. Um, and that's not going to do well for your elbows, your shoulders, rotator cuff stuff. It's, it's, just, it's not a good idea. The cheaper option is get an external uh, mouse and keyboard. You can also get an external monitor and flip it around the other way, but really limit the amount of time you're just sitting at a kitchen table on a laptop without any kind of uh, accommodations beside that. Yeah, I mean, that's totally right. I mean, I, that's exactly what I stumbled on from like, wish I would have had to be able to listen to you and not have to like do the trial and error, but I use a monitor that's plugged into my laptop that has an external keyboard and mouse. So I'm running a laptop, but with a monitor keyboard and mouse, and it helps me certainly feel a lot better. Now, okay, let's talk about the kind of movement people do to break up their sitting. Is there, is it anything or is it walking? Is it stretching? And it's like, is it, what do you particularly recommend people do? And I love the fact that it's movement because mm -hmm. that's, that's the key word is that it should be movement as opposed to thinking exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find that a lot of times when I say movement, people go, okay, I'm going to do some squats. I'm like, and that's squats are movement, but movement goes far past simply exercise. So going and doing a chore, like I have plenty of chores around my house that I have to do and going and sweeping the kitchen, for example. Great. I get to move. I get to put in rotation, side to yeah. side motion. It's a variety of things that I get to do, but it's not exercise inherently. It's movement. And usually what I say is, so we have predominantly in our society, forward and backward motion, flexion, yeah. extension. Um, most of our exercises, that's exactly what they are. Yeah. Push-ups, pull-ups, squats, everything is there. We have some lateral motion. Um, it's definitely less, but there is some there. You can see things like lateral lunges and all that fun stuff. Yeah. And then you have twisting. Mm -hmm. And in our culture, twisting is far more used as a word for injury or something bad that you did than it is as part of an exercise. But really, right. we should be good. And that's where all the control and that's where your core comes in is in those twisting motions. Mm -hmm. So in these times when you can move, if you're going, I don't know what to do and you don't have any chores you need to do, making sure that you're implementing the twisting portion and the lateral, the side to side portion is is going to be the best because most of the time you're already moving in the forwards and backwards. Yeah. The warning is don't feel that you have to add weight to it. Just, yeah. just move because especially with the twisting, a lot of times you may not be ready. And so it may be the gentle twisting and moving. Um, it doesn't have to be vigorous. It just has to be movement. Um, mm. But making sure that you're doing the side to side and the twisting part so that you're exposing your body to these movements frequently, because I find more and more people, especially with age, they do less and less of twisting. And then when they twist, it hurts. Right. Yeah. And it seems so interesting because a lot of the sports that people end up picking up in the later half of life are twisting sports. A lot of people like to golf. A lot of people like to play tennis or pickleball, but yet we never train this, like this twisting motion, which engages the core in like such a different way. I think that's a brilliant point. Now, how do we improve spinal health? Like, let's say there's someone who's listening to this, who's 50 years old, feels like their back is okay, but has had off and on low back pain for many years um, and knows there's tightness in the body in different areas. Like what's the, what's the general strategy for creating a healthier spine on both like a muscular level, but maybe also working more directly with the spine, the ligaments and the bones itself? Absolutely. So mobility is going to be, is going to be the key. And for those that might be going mobility, you mean like flexibility? They're a little bit different. So flexibility is really how far can your joint go? Mm -hmm. Mobility is how far can you actually take and move your own joint? Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm sure that I can like push somebody's hip really, really far, but they're going to be in pain while doing it. So th th it's not the same thing. Um, great little exercises like uh, cat cows or spinal mm -hmm. waves um, and things like that. They, they will let you control and see if you have the ability to move your spine. 
The catch is most of us, we don't do that often. And if somebody says, you know, just move your spine, we go, what? I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't understand how to do that. So then we can use movements that are above and below. So things like child's pose is inevitably going to bend your spine. Mm -hmm. uh, things like upward facing dog is inevitably going to extend your spine into the other position. And so finding those, those ways of going from extreme and controlling it back and forth, that's how you can work on some more of that mobility side of things. Now, you can have all the flexibility of the spine that you want, but if you don't have the right muscle strength and coordination, that mobility piece won't be there. So you might go to lift something and you can still hurt yourself. That's where we go, what are the muscles that are going to help the spine move properly? Once again, we're coming back to our glutes um, that we sit on so much, but they're going to be a huge helper, especially for guys um, to be able to lift some of those heavier weights because a lot of guys want to go like, yeah, I got to be strong. And that's where the adage of lift with your legs, not your back comes from is mm. your hip extension when you can actually fully come on up should be done by your glutes, by your big hip muscles, as opposed to by your little spine extensors mm -hmm. and making sure that you change that dynamic of what the right muscles are working. You're going to let your back feel a little bit uh, better, but by far most important is mobility, 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 and making sure that you're getting your spine moving, even if it's a little bit every day. And I would say multiple times throughout the day. What does your daily routine look like? Like as a, as a man who studied this deeply, right? And you know, both the research and you know how to help people implement this. What does an average work day in your life look like in terms of when you get up, how you move, how you work, how you pause for movement? Can you run us through that? Absolutely. Um, so usually I get up without an alarm clock uh, because I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. And lately that's been around 620. Nice. Um, and the, I don't know why, just like <laughs> clockwork every time I check. And my immediate thing is I, I put on my shoes and I go right out the door. Um, it's getting colder and colder, but still most of the time now maybe adding in uh, intervals. So mm -hmm. where I will run a little bit, that way I warm up, but it's movement. It's mm -hmm. I start and I go and I move. If it's like a torrential downpour, it's a little bit of yoga, but it doesn't stop. The habit is still there. Get up, go move. Um, the body's been stationary for hours and hours on end. It needs movement. It's usually very gentle movement. So that's why it's usually walking or gentle yoga. I'm not going to do high intensity interval training, mm -hmm. uh, weightlifting right then. If I was to, which sometimes I do a, a morning workout, a morning strength workout, there is mobility, there's a warm up uh, before that. I have made the mistake uh, of not warming up before, and I've had plenty of injuries of my back, and it's, it's never worth it. Mm -hmm. Take the time warm up. It's so so important for you in that case. Um, after that, it's usually right into meetings or trying to create content. And if it's a virtual call, I'm standing up for it. That's, that's definitely happening. Uh, right now, I'm very lucky in the sense of I'm getting ready for a TED talk and I'm practicing four times a day. Mm -hmm. That's done in standing. So I can put it throughout my day that it breaks up my sitting that I know I'm going to have to stand up and practice my talk for 15 minutes great. So now I know that I'm not going to do that all in one bout. It's going to be throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And then usually there's a strength-based workout in the afternoon. I lately, I love playing around with different things. Go figure, became a physical therapist, mm -hmm. right? Um, but pulling, pushing, twisting, what are some fun combinations that I can uh, bring into it? The variety. It's, it always comes down to variety um, because one, it keeps it very fun. Uh, but two, it really lets me use my body in the ways that I want to. So mm. sometimes I may even practice some martial arts or anything like that, just as a part to do a different movement and teach mm. my body a different movement. And then usually an evening walk. Um, and usually I do that with my wife. Uh, she doesn't get a whole lot of exercise throughout the day, mm. even though I get on her case. Yeah. Uh, but that way we can kind of have that communal calming down. And that also helps me calm the mind because I, okay, mm. the day is over. I don't have to worry about work anymore. I think it kind of calm that down. And then right before I go to bed, usually eh, one or two stretches. I usually try to hit the hip flexors because I know that they're going to still be very tight for me. And then that's it. That's my whole day in terms of movement. So you have bookends of your day that seem to be like outside walking and or a little more vigorous sometimes in the morning, but both ends, you're doing some kind of walk in the middle. Anytime you can stand, you effectively are for things that are practical to stand for. And then if you are sitting, you're getting up or you try to stick to the round the every 20 minutes rule. 
I, I do. And at this point, I used to use a timer. Um, I used to use a timer and had a, a little list that I made. And it was a list of exercises that I wanted to try, the fun ones that I might have seen, or chores that required moving. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as the timer went off, I had the list and I would go, I'd be like, this is the one that I'm going to go and do right now. That worked for me. I'm not saying that's going to necessarily work for everyone. That was how I decided to do it. But now I have a really good and intuitive kind of pattern yeah. of, I know how long this will take. And I just automatically am getting up every 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. There might be the odd hour that I sit, but then usually if that happens, I get up and I go, all right, I'm actually going to do some stretching. I'm going to take more than one to two minutes to move. I'm going to do five, maybe 10 minutes of movement. Nice. All right. So now I have a couple like random questions that have just come to mind. What do you do if you're on a big, long flight? You're flying East Coast to West Coast, West Coast to East Coast. You have five, six hours of, of flying. How do you manage these longer times or a long road trip or something where you know there's prolonged sitting? I can perfectly answer that. Well, in both cases, we just went on our honeymoon to um, the Pacific Northwest, which was about a five-hour flight. And shamelessly, I got up to the bathroom repeatedly. Um, and part of it was, yes, I was getting up to actually go, but also just to get to move a little bit more back and forth. Um, the other part is before getting on the plane, most people are sitting down waiting with their bags. I'm over there stretching, moving, whatever it may be. Um, and it's, it's trying to sit as little as I can before I get on the flight. And then as soon as I get off the flight, getting a little bit more movement in. Usually that's easy because you're running to get your bags. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, yeah, it's pretty hard to get movement throughout without, you don't want to disturb the person next to you going to the bathroom, but it's just so much better for you uh, to do it. I almost always try to get aisle seats for that specific reason, just so yeah. I can. And if, hey, this is a great thought of it. If they tell you, hey, you, can you move? I got to go. Great. You got movement in. It's a good thing if they kind of disturb you and have you get up a little bit more. Um, now, when it comes to road trips, I'm notoriously known as the guy that whenever we stop at a, a rest area, I'm the one hanging on a tree um, afterwards when everybody comes out because I, I'm always just, yeah, I don't like sitting in the car for a long period of time. And so I'm always moving and doing something. Um, it doesn't have to be specifically exercise. The reason I like to put exercise there is because it's more of that concentrated stimulus for all the sitting that we're doing. Nice. Okay. This segues perfectly to my next question mm -hmm. about the tree hanging. What are your thoughts on decompressing the spine? Like I, in my office, I, I have a, I have a pull-up bar over here that I use mostly a lot for more for hanging than actually for pull-ups. And I have an inversion table over there. And these are tools I've accumulated over the years, but I've heard mixed thoughts from different doctors of physical therapy on spinal traction and the use of it. What are your thoughts on people using at home ways to decompress the spine through hanging or upside down inversion table type stuff? So I'm all for it. I love that you have both. What do mm -hmm. I uh, mean by the, the both here is that you're hanging from hands overhead, so head up, and then you're also hanging head down because obviously the pull is going to be different um, mm -hmm. just due to gravity of, of where that, that's going to happen. That undoubtedly helps. Now, I am more partial to the hanging on the bar. This is only because for a lot of people going upside down, you're getting into blood pressure issues. Mm -hmm. um, if they have knee... well osteoarthritis yeah. in the knee, it actually might help because it gives it some good distraction. Mm -hmm. But knee, hip, ankle things, sometimes you can get into fishy situations there. But the idea of what it does for the spine, I'm, I'm for it. I do think that we overall don't hang uh, enough. Also in terms of hanging is building up that forearm strength and mm -hmm. generally that shoulder strength from just a static hold of hanging. We don't do it enough. And I think a lot of people would be surprised that just they can do a bunch of pull-ups but when they hang there, yeah, you can't do it for too long. It, mm -hmm. it really takes a lot out of you. Yeah, that I think that's a great answer. And you know what's funny is I, I it used to be way more for inversion tables, and I started hearing people like you discuss the benefits of like hanging as a, like a little more natural way to get shoulder traction and spinal traction. And I think it's a really good thing for people to do, just because we get so much compression, you actually have to actively go seek spinal distraction. So compression will find you. You got to go get the distraction. Next question. What are your what are your thoughts and feelings on different like tools like myofascial tools, foam rollers, uh, lacrosse balls, any type of things that, that you think are good for people to use on a regular basis or that you use personally? I have used all of them, and my biggest thing, and this is also the answer for what is the best exercise regimen. It's the one that you're going to use and the one you're going to do, um, because sure, a foam roller can help, but if you use it once and then it stays in the closet for seven months. Uh, don't get a foam roller. It's going to be completely pointless. Um, a lot of times this is where I go, 
get into the habit of using something. So I usually give patients, hey, do you have a tennis ball at home? Um, do you have a rolling pin at home or something else? Can you get into the habit of doing that or even just doing a stretch? If you've cultivated the habit, okay, go ahead and buy the thing and buy the foam roller. But all those um, release ones, yeah, I'm for it. Um, I don't know if you have to spend a whole lot of money for things like uh, the massage guns and all of that mm-hmm. that are really the high end. To me, I think you can do a lot with a foam roller yeah. as long as you're consistent with it and also add in some good stretches. Uh, there's a lot of benefit that can be done there. Totally. I, I agree 100% with you. And what I've found from my own personal experimentation is one, it's good to tie those tools to like a particular area of your house where you may be normally having sedentary time. Like when our family goes, if we go into the living room, we are watching a TV, a movie or a show or something, I'll often be pulling out these tools and be able to spend time with the family, but still be able to do some rolling and stuff like that. So like the location aspect is big to anchor that habit. So that's really cool. And that's also, um, we talked about how to increase um, standing or reduce sitting at work, but you can do that same thing for home. So if it is, oh, we like to finish off most evenings watching TV, well, can you stand at a counter and can you do some stretches or can you do other things while watching TV? And just like you're saying, you can find these healthy habits that you can add into everyday life. All right. I have another question. This was one that came to my mind a little bit earlier. Um, and it's, it's from my personal experience, but I think it's very relevant. And I'd like to know what your thoughts are about the link between this movement, this commitment to movement and having a mind that's less chattery and a little more like meditative, if you will. Have you noticed any connections to that? Uh, yes. And there's definitely a bit more of it in terms of repetitive movement. I should say, um, when, and really that's when you're looking more of the, the, the cardio based kind of things where it's, um, it's the same motion over and over and over, and you can get into this mindful rhythm, uh, and almost meditative rhythm of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to actually listen to podcasts and, and books when I uh, do that. When we get into the strength training part, for me, it's the focus because all of a sudden you have to focus on a very specific task, mm-hmm. the reps, whatever it may be that you have to quiet all the other things. Yeah. Um, y- you really aren't, aren't quite able. And so not to mention all the wonderful endorphins that you get from it mm-hmm. inevitably help to improve the, the mental clarity and all that. Yeah, that, that really makes sense. You know, like I think like the, the idea of the running and the repetitive action like really helps the mind zone in. And I think even even like I I take a morning walk as well. Like I take a morning walk with my dog every morning, get some sunshine on my skin, breathe through my nose. And I find that just practicing the, the, the constant art of being aware of the body helps you become more present in general. Cause I think back to the years when I was sitting with poor posture and working long hours and sitting way too prolonged. Um, oftentimes you're just not aware that you're in this like contorted position and you're definitely less present. Like the chatter is going on and then the body is not surprisingly in, in a state that's not like really balanced. So that seems really, really interesting. If people are going, uh, Hey, I, uh... You know, I, I don't know. So you're saying I, if I'm feeling overwhelmed at work, I need to go and run or walk for 30 minutes or go exercise for an hour. No. Um, so some of the research even shows that as, as much as a 10 minute walk um, will basically reset your focus um, and help to reclarify things. So don't feel that it has to be something huge and big. It, it, it really can be a little bit and it does help to reset things. Do you believe there's any benefit specifically to moving outside or have you seen any research on that or is it just moving in general? It is moving in general, but I think there is there is definitely an added uh, benefit to moving outside. Partially, you're you're just getting better air and better sunshine. We mm-hmm. can talk about all the vitamin D. We can talk about the fact that um, the receptors for us from sunlight through our eyes is going to make us more alert and more aware, more in time with our circadian rhythms, so that you are more alert, and that's going to be a, a benefit. An interesting thing that I learned that um, baffled me was that. We have receptors in the eyes for vitamin D as well through the sunlight. So if you're wearing sunglasses, right, um, having to reduce that as well. Um, But I I think it's better. I think it's more natural. Uh, The other thing is that moving outside and doing things outside, it makes it not perfect. It makes it a little bit uneven. And that's really how our bodies are meant to move. They're not meant to be so static and perfect and even. Um, And so overall, I think it's great. Yeah, you have to deal with the temperature changes and the wind and the rain, but that's also kind of life and that's what really helps our body. That's really well said. 
And, you know, I, I think it's interesting that your background is a, is effectively like a green background, green screen. Because I originally saw some of the, there was research about like the fact that when people walk in the presence of the color of green, whether in a forest, like they get more parasympathetic tone. And they even found if you exercise in a green painted room, like literally just painting the walls of your gym green, there was some benefits. So there's obviously something deeply baked into um, how the human mechanism works that like loves to be outside. So I'm definitely a huge proponent of more um, even movement. And I think like, imagine you take your after dinner walk or your evening walk with your wife outside, right? I mean, that seems like a, you're getting that in a couple of times every day. And I think it's more powerful than it seems like at the surface. Absolutely. And I think anybody can go and try this, please be safe, obviously, but take your walk around the, the subdivision or in a, a downtown area or wherever you live. It'll still be good. It'll still be enjoyable. And then see if you can go out to a park and take a walk and just see the difference. The exercise is the same, but the outcome is vastly different. Nice. Well, this was like really insightful. And I think even it, as insightful, but also super practical. Like the thing I think is so powerful about the stuff you teach is it's like the foundational things. We have these bodies, they will be in a posture, in some posture, and you're just like, let's make it a conscious posture in many different types of movement. And so I want to give you the four one more time to share, um, you know, any, any closing messages. And I'd also like you to share how you work with people, where people can find you. And if someone's listening up to this conversation at this point, and they're like, I really feel like I could use extra accountability, coaching, and some direction from someone like you, who's an expert in creating, and not just like, this is information, but applying this stuff into your life. Um, how can people also get in contact with you? The overall thing we touched on sit less as opposed to the moving more. When it comes down to it, all of these interventions, including even the fit father and fit mother um, project is it has to work with your life. A lot of the meal plans, it's the same, it's the same concept. If it doesn't work for your life, you're not supposed to try to force it into it or somehow do it. And I think that's the biggest thing is don't try to force movement into your life. Try to find those ways that you go, okay, this is benefiting me. This is more natural for me. And I do like this. I understand maybe taking a walk initially is not as pleasant as sitting slouched in front of a TV, but with time, and if that walk only lasts five or 10 minutes initially, it will get there uh, because that's just nature. That's how mm -hmm. we're built and our body loves it and craves movement. What I do primarily is this kind of more of the work side related things of helping people change their, their patterns and their habits. I'm on Instagram. If you want more content and you're just going, hey, I want constant reminders and, and more of this stuff. Stefan.Zavalin, that's the Instagram part. And you can also find me that way on LinkedIn. If you want to some more in-depth videos uh, from the side of sort of the physical therapy and all of that, you can go to my website, which is ltmmtl.com. Uh, stands for Love to Move, Move to Love, because the company I, I made is Love to Move for obvious reasons um, as we're trying to do more of that. Uh, but really, the whole goal is, like I said, to, to, if we can do to make a movement movement um, and really change how we're approaching everyday life and everyday work. Yeah, I mean, you're spot on. And I will throw, make sure we throw all the links to your Instagram, your website in the show notes so people will have those. You know, you can find on the blog, you will to click right to Dr. Stefan's stuff. And I truly appreciate you for being a champion of this super important message. Um, I always like to think that too many people in this, in, in generally the health education space, they like, they major in the minors. Like there's so many people who are talking about like this complicated supplement and how this nutrient interacts. And it's like, what you're sharing is like literally probably more important than any supplement discussion we could possibly ever have. It's like how to keep your body healthy by giving it what it needs in its movement. So thank you for being on here and, and being a champion of this message. I truly appreciate it. And I'm excited to get this out to people. Oh, my absolute pleasure. I love talking about this. <laughs> yeah. It's good. It's a passion. Thank you, Dr. Stefan. We'll talk to you soon.